Hi, welcome to Connect with the CEO. I'm Joanne Conroy, President and CEO of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. You know, these are great opportunities for me to interview some of our experts here at Dartmouth Hitchcock and answer some of my questions and your questions about medical conditions and medical issues that are important to all of us. This month is Heart Month. And if you know anybody that's really an advocate for um, understanding the impact of heart disease on women, you would have seen a lot of people running around with a lot of red on last Friday um, when it was go red for women. Um, but many of us are wearing red throughout the month to actually symbolize how important it is for women to understand the symptoms and the treatments for heart disease that are specific for women. I am thrilled today to have Dr. Carrie Lynn Hennessy here, who's one of our expert cardiologists in heart health, to talk about uh, women's heart health specifically this month. So thank you for joining us, Carrie Lynn. Thank you, Joanne. I'm really excited to be here. I've been looking forward to joining this audience all week. Now, um, we were talking earlier about we had to really go through our closets in order to find something red because my um, closet is a sea of navy, black, brown, and muted colors. And um, But it does symbolize something for women. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the campaign. It's, it's been going on for a few years, hasn't it? Yeah, Go I red think, for women. I think, as you mentioned, it's a really powerful symbol because it's not an everyday color that people tend to wear in a professional environment. And every time I've worn red this month, you get comments like, very nice red jacket. It's eye popping. It's, you know, attention getting. And that's the purpose. So the American Heart Association for years has really been trying to raise awareness that cardiovascular disease affects women very similarly to male populations. I think since the 80s, when we first detected that deaths from cardiovascular disease for women actually exceeded men that year. Mm -hmm. From that point on, we've been collecting data and um, you know, using professional societies and outlets like this to let the community know what their biggest health risks really are. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting, pink has symbolized breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's become almost, you don't even have to say anything about it. Um, and one hopes that red would do the same thing for women in heart health and people would actually think about it when they saw a woman wearing red. Absolutely. I think people do see pink and see the pink ribbon banner and know immediately that this is um, a topic about breast cancer or this is raising awareness. And I think the important things for women to know is that you're actually seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. So, mm -hmm. well, they're, they've done an excellent job raising awareness, and that's certainly a health problem that requires attention and concern and screening and professional evaluation. We're still sort of catching up when it comes to cardiovascular disease and making sure that women truly understand that they are at risk too. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit more. What, what are the symptoms for women um, that are um, experiencing some cardiac problems? Because yeah. I think we believe now they're a little bit different than men. Yeah, and that's true. We, we can have more subtle presentations with cardiovascular disease as women. I think the major tape home point I'd really want the community to know is that while there are differences, there are remarkable similarities. So if I overemphasize differences, I don't want people to think um, that they might not feel the same thing because the most common symptom for cardiovascular disease, particularly ischemic heart disease, so problems related to blood flow delivery to the heart muscle, it's usually chest pain for mm -hmm. men and women. Mm -hmm. But what we found, there was a big study um, called the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation that tried to characterize what happens to women compared to men. Mm -hmm. And so while everyone may have chest pain, shortness of breath is another common symptom. And that one may be slightly more common in women than men, that you have chest, I mean, shortness of breath alone without a chest discomfort. Mm -hmm. Um, and then typical for us chest pain, as a cardiologist, when I talk to patients about their chest pain, what we're thinking of as a heart-related chest pain is really, I'd want you to tell me about any pain that you're having, I say between your earlobes and your belly button. Yeah. Because most of that is chest territory. There's a lot of organs in there and there's certainly overlap with other issues, but I would rather have the opportunity to ask questions about it and to figure out for myself if I think that's heart-related yeah. than to have someone think it doesn't you know, read like the textbook, this couldn't be heart disease. Yeah. Um, 
Think about maybe the last two or three patients you've had, women that mm -hmm. have had new onset um, cardiac ischemia. Yeah. And um, talk about their symptoms. You yeah. know, when we say chest pain, sometimes it, it doesn't feel real yeah. to people. And th that's really an important point is that pain means something different to different people. And so pain may be pressure. It might feel like a tightness or a squeezing in mm -hmm. your chest. Um, sometimes it feels like people describe it as um, someone sitting on my chest mm -hmm. or just a discomfort that makes it difficult to breathe. It really could be, it doesn't have to be pain that mm -hmm. makes you say, ouch. It mm -hmm. could be discomfort that's mm -hmm. somewhat subtle. And the things that we watch for is the location. Mm -hmm. So I, because of the Pledge of Allegiance, we often think our heart is here. Mm -hmm but more likely heart pain is right in the middle, okay. underneath the sternum. Um, and then we think about what provokes it. Mm -hmm. And so if someone tells me, for example, that I get chest pain every time I go cross-country skiing, because mm -hmm. that's a very popular activity up here, that patient may have cardiac disease. Mm -hmm. One thing we've realized over time is that women can experience stress a little bit more often than men. And so emotional stress mm -hmm. is equivalent to exertion. And okay. so if someone says, every time I argue with my son or daughter, I get chest pressure right here. Mm -hmm. That's something that I would take seriously because it's provoked by the same sort of stress response that exercise is. Mm -hmm. And so it's the quality of the pain and the location of the pain, mm -hmm. what makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And then if we know, what makes it better? Because some patients who know they have vascular disease have um, pills to relieve the pain. And if yeah. they work, I think that's likely heart pain. For those that don't, if you rest and it goes away, that would be a pain that you'd want to tell a doctor about because it started when you moved, it stopped when you rested, or it started when you were having the argument and it went away when you calmed down and it was here in your chest. I would want to talk to you about that one. Yeah. Now, um, how about if you... Um, have chest pain and you're completely at rest. Mm. You're sitting on the sofa wa watching TV. Yeah, I think there, if you have new rest pain, typically we'd recommend that people call 911 for that. The mm -hmm. reason is if you're doing nothing when it starts and it's in your chest and you've never had chest pain before, it's very difficult to tell someone over the phone you are not having a heart attack. Yeah, We need data to help us to make that estimation and it's often too much of an emergency to casually call a provider and schedule an appointment in a few days. If yeah. this happened when you're doing nothing, the best thing is to get care immediately. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of the time one of the barriers really is people worrying that they are um, going to be perceived as a hypochondriac or right. someone who's over interpreting their pain. I'd much rather have someone come in and get an EKG and get some blood work and have someone talk to them about their pain, and then we start an evaluation for it, then to try to deal with it on their own. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, about the shortness of breath. Yeah. Um, yeah like, well, how does that present, and is it the same type of chest tightness, or is it maybe a little bit different? So it can be different. The shortness of breath um, typically would be when you're doing physical activity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like just like rest chest pain, unusual shortness of breath that comes out of nowhere when you're not doing anything. It could be heart disease, but it could also be other things. And so that's another red flag symptom that if it comes out of nowhere, you've never experienced this before, we don't have any idea what it is. We're going to need more tests to know. Um, but typical, just like the chest pain, it's sort of provoked by movement or stress mm -hmm. and then gets better if you rest or relax or maybe take a nitroglycerin pill for those that have those at mm -hmm. home. So it kind of follows the similar cadence of mm -hmm. provoking factors. So I always take the stairs and I usually go up five flights at a pretty fast clip from the first floor to the fifth floor in the main building. But I'm always a little bit breathless when I get to the top. Yeah. That doesn't fall into the category of shortness of breath. It just means I'm out of shape. <laughs> So everyone's category of out of shape is slightly different. I also get breathless on the stairs and I do exercise. Stairs are particularly challenging cardiac work because of the elevation. So we can give ourselves a little bit of a break on the stairs. And people here are very used to hilly environments. So we have people who hike or hunt or, you know, ski or cross country ski. And they're used to inclines more than what I've seen in urban yeah. populations. So 
if the stairs make one breathless, I'm more reassured that, by that than mm -hmm. if it happened without any provocation or if it was flat ground. Yeah. And it's really a change over time. So if you said I could do five flights with X amount of breathlessness, uh -huh. but over time you realize that at three flights you are now breathless. Yeah or at the top, you have to rest 10 minutes to get your breath back instead yeah. of the one minute it used to take you. That's a change. Yeah. So that's what we probe for when we bring people in to talk about their symptoms is to really pin down what provokes it, how bad is it, how long does it last, what are your other medical problems, mm -hmm. and how can we understand if this is coronary artery disease? Because really, that coronary artery disease is the number one killer of people in the United States. It's yeah. the number one killer of women in the United States. And it actually takes a life every 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, much more prevalent than most people think. Much more, much more. Um, a separate question about testing. Um, you know, we used to say that, um, you know, a, a EKG or a stress test, you know, could determine cardiac disease in anybody. Um, Yet, I think there was some evidence that women may perform differently on some of those tests. Yeah. Everything has to be sort of taken into the context of who the person is. I think we've learned a lot using evidence from that women's ischemia evaluation study, which showed us that women are more likely to have slightly abnormal EKGs mm -hmm. at baseline when you're not moving. And so then when we put you on a treadmill and we're trying to read EKGs while you're running or walking hard and they're more difficult to interpret, um, they're slightly more likely to get the abnormal result from a treadmill alone mm -hmm. test. Okay. And so often people get tests, stress tests that include imaging to mm -hmm. give us another layer of certainty. So we see how you feel when you exercise, what your blood pressure does, what your heart rate does, um, what your EKGs do in all of those stress tests. But then on top of it, we can take pictures of the heart mm -hmm. with a variety of different modalities. Here we use cardiac ultrasound, um, mm -hmm. which is safe, no radiation. We use nuclear perfusion imaging, which has a little bit of radioactive tracer to track mm -hmm. blood flow. And then we take pictures of the heart and slice it to see, is there any dark area? Yep. So is there any area without flow? Um, and we're actually developing a PET program next month. So the perfusion imaging, is, we're getting a sort of even better look for mm -hmm. coronary artery disease very, very soon. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of options when it comes to testing for what is going on when someone has new symptoms. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I have had you know, not only friends, but, you know, colleagues that have been diagnosed with heart disease, but their symptoms have been so subtle. They mm -hmm. just actually didn't feel well. Talk a little bit about the importance of kind of patients being kind of self-aware of what's going on in their own body when they're actually talking to their provider. Oh, absolutely. That is another really important question because while we've talked about men and women, the most common symptom is chest pain. With women, they may be slightly more likely to have shortness of breath alone without mm -hmm. the chest pain. Mm -hmm. But women can also have unusual symptoms and more symptoms than mm -hmm. men altogether. So it's not just a discomfort or a breathing problem. Sometimes people feel nausea mm -hmm. or they actually vomit mm -hmm. or they get sweaty mm -hmm. or the pain is not actually even in the chest. Like I said, it's closer to the earlobe. It's somewhere up in your neck or your jaw. Mm -hmm. I think you have a toothache mm -hmm. every time you go skiing. Um, you know, there, there can be a lot of different symptoms and that generally feeling unwell, mm -hmm. if you feel like you can't do things that you used to be able to do, it's useful to let your doctor know because it, yeah. it might not be cardiovascular disease, but it could be, and it could be something else. And women can feel that kind of flu-like feeling unwell. We see that where they didn't feel chest pain or shortness of breath, but they had a little bit of nausea, they felt very low energy, they couldn't mm -hmm. take the stairs anymore, yeah. and they weren't sure what was going on, but it didn't seem like a big enough deal to ask. Mm -hmm. And I would just say to people here that it is a big enough deal to ask. Anytime that you think that you feel differently, you feel less well mm -hmm. than you used to feel, you know, have someone weigh in, that's what our job is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's giving permission to people to kind of say, I think there's something wrong, but I don't really know what it is, uh -huh. is probably a pretty good indicator that you need to follow up with your primary care provider. And they have a very um, like quick turnaround, I think. To Absolutely. Consult. And we see that where our, your primary care doctor sees you and they evaluate your risk factors. Because when we're talking about women with heart disease, 
the awareness over time has actually decreased. And mm -hmm. so the American Heart Association tracks you know, how many women die of cardiovascular disease, how many women have heart attacks and strokes, but also mm -hmm. how many women know that that's their number one health threat. Yeah. And less than half women that are surveyed know that cardiovascular disease yeah. is their number one health threat. And so if you're not aware of it, it's very difficult for you to go to the doctor and think that this could be the problem. Yeah. You know, it has to be sort of within your realm of possibilities. So that's why it's so important that we let people know that it really is. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of risk factors that we can kind of keep an eye on for years before you even get to the point where you're wondering. There's a lot of things we can do to prevent heart disease yeah. if you know it's a potential problem. Um, now, most of our viewers know that they're supposed to send in some questions. And I see I'm, I'm scaling through here and I, I see that we have a number of them. OK. Um, just a couple things before we go to some viewer questions. Um, what are the risk factors for women? Are they different than for men? Yeah, so I think what we found is that the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are similar between the sexes. Our ability to identify them early enough to have people in care and to know that they have them is overall, it's not optimized yet. So women, mm. because they may think of themselves as lower risk, may not get their blood pressure checked as often. Mm -hmm. They may go a little bit longer before we identify that it's been riding high mm -hmm. for a few years, similar with... Um, you know, everyone thinks of smoking. Smoking mm -hmm. is still a problem. I think one in six men smoke and one in eight women. Okay. And so it's still a significant problem, but the biggest health threats on the latest survey were really related to abdominal obesity. So mm -hmm. carrying extra weight, particularly around the middle where it's sort of communicating with our organs mm -hmm. um, and diabetes as well. So mm -hmm. that constellation of having high sugars, having some metabolic dysfunction, storing extra fat, which is communicating abnormally with our body, those are, are things that increase the risk for heart disease. And then cholesterol, that's another important one that people should really have checked to know, where are we falling? Is there any prevention that is not just watching my diet or exercising yeah. more that would help me to prevent a heart attack or stroke? Yeah, people should know their numbers, their blood pressure, their weight, mm -hmm. <clears throat> their blood sugar. Yeah and their cholesterol. I was so. just talking to my husband last night, actually. Um, we had a cholesterol check for him and we were walking through it and he was asking me questions that I should have told him about and should be more on top of. <laughs> so it's not just an everywhere problem. I see it in my own household, even as a cardiologist. We just need to be on top of what the, the numbers are and what the priorities are. Even if it's exercise more, that is a legitimate health priority. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting though that the understanding your lipids and your kind of cholesterol is actually pretty complicated. Yes. And cholesterol is actually a calculation. Talk a little bit about that because I think women get their test results and they are like, what does this mean? Yeah. <clears throat> and so when you get a cholesterol test, you're going to get basically four pieces of information. Usually you'll get the total cholesterol. You'll get the LDL you'll get the HDL, which I like to think of as the healthy cholesterol. That's mm -hmm. the good cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, LDL is the quote unquote bad cholesterol, the cholesterol we'd like to lower. Mm -hmm. And then we get triglycerides. So you're gonna get all four pieces of information with one blood test, which is great because mm -hmm. you don't have to get four vials of blood to get all that info. Um, each of them carry different risk for heart disease. So what we see is LDL in particular, we call it the bad cholesterol. And our target for that is really less than 100. Mm -hmm. When babies are born, when we're kids, nomadic cultures, your LDL is closer to 30. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're physically active and eating different diets. Right. But for us, we target here less than 100 for everyone. Mm -hmm. If you have cardiovascular disease, we push that even lower. Mm -hmm. And so targets that are closer to 70, that's mm -hmm. ideal. In Europe, they, they choose 55. For their LDL. Uh, yeah, for the LDL, when okay. you have established disease or if you have diabetes and you have high risk for it, mm -hmm. we may really want to optimize that because it's very much linked to your risk of having a heart attack and stroke. The mm -hmm. longer we can keep your cholesterol less than 70, the farther in life you will get before experiencing one of those events. Mm -hmm. And so keeping the cholesterol low through diet is, is a big way to do that or medication. Yeah. Um, that's one of the targets. The HDL is the good stuff mm -hmm. that we like over 40. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically physical activity and sometimes just good genes help. Yeah, my, 
my HDL is like 150. So that's, I, that's excellent. One of those great, yes. I, it's all in genes. It has nothing to do with what I eat. Yeah, and women tend to have slightly higher HDL than men. We have higher healthy cholesterol because of our estrogen. And mm -hmm. then around the time of menopause, it's a really critical time to rethink mm -hmm. whether or not you still have that protection mm -hmm. because you may be protected in younger life and then later the HDL may fall. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to sort of keep an eye on your cholesterol, not just once, yeah. but with body weight changes, with diet changes, with physical activity changes, with hormonal changes. When you see your, your physician, they'll be ordering that to see the, the trend over time. Yeah. yeah. And how about triglycerides? Because if you have a coffee with cream right before you go yeah. to have your labs drawn, it may show up. Absolutely. The triglycerides are the most sensitive to what you ate immediately prior to the blood draw. We do typically ask people to fast, which means don't eat anything, usually after midnight, which most people aren't up snacking. But if you mm -hmm. don't eat after midnight and you come in in the morning and get your blood um, tested, that should be adequate to make sure it's a fasting triglyceride because that's very sensitive to food. Mm -hmm. We don't typically use specific medications for triglycerides mm -hmm. um, unless they're very high. Mm -hmm. So ideal... I think is less than 150. Mm -hmm. Most people are probably around there. Um, if you're getting up to 500, that mm -hmm. would require medication. Mm. Yeah, it, it would seem like that would be a tube of blood that would be a little bit yeah. milky. Yes, so. it would be a little milky looking. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, I want to first, before we go to our questions, remind the viewers that Carrie Lynn is going to be a guest speaker at our upcoming, upcoming Healthy Living Series online mm -hmm. event, and that'll yes. be February 23rd, to dig more into the issues of heart health during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of delay, delays in care, mm -hmm. people not seeking care, thinking they're gonna manage their symptoms at home, and it's a whole new area of study, I think, for us yeah, in absolutely. healthcare. Um, I do have a number of questions from okay. viewers. So one um, person is 20 years old, and her mom died of a heart attack, should she be concerned that she will have one? And is there any screening that she should do? Yes, so the answer about your concern is that you'd rather think about it as a possibility and think ahead like you are as to how you could avoid that outcome. I think you're, it's never too early to talk to a physician about that risk. Uh, the big thing to know about your genetic risk or um, sort of that feeling that whatever happened to my family member is definitely going to happen to me. It's not a one-to-one, -one, so it does not mean you are doomed to have mm -hmm. a heart attack or a stroke. What it means is that all the risk factors that we typically manage in every patient, we may more intensively manage in your case, or if we find that there was a genetic susceptibility. Mm -hmm. For example, some 20-year-olds have high cholesterol and there's mm -hmm. nothing they could do about it. And I know people that started taking statins in college because yeah. they have familial hypercholesterolemia. That's a real thing that increases risk, whether or not you have any other risk factors. So I think getting the cholesterol checked, mm -hmm. making sure you have normal sugars, kind of shooting for an ideal body weight, you know, a goal body weight for whatever your height is. And we can kind of estimate that in the office and mm -hmm. figure out where would be a healthy body weight for you. Um, and then really optimizing diet and physical activity. Mm -hmm. There was a really amazing study where they allowed patients to eat the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. um, so the American diet we call standard American diet. It is sad. And that is because we eat far too much animal products and dairy as opposed to vegetables. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot more butter and sort of fats in our cooking than olive oil. Right. And so when we told patients to eat a Mediterranean diet, even if they didn't lose weight, they had a 30% reduction in oh, their wow. risk of having a, a major adverse cardiovascular event over a long period of time. Wow. That's a huge reduction. That's the same as medication. So diet is hugely important. We have a wonderful nutritionist for those that are interested named Jean Copeland, um, who helps us enormously. So when we have someone who maybe doesn't need medicines from me mm -hmm. to manage their heart risks, but we could improve your diet, I will very often recommend that you have a consultation with our nutritionist yeah. to make sure that we're not missing an opportunity uh -huh. to give you long-term health. And it might not just be cardiovascular prevention, it may be just overall feeling better. Yeah. Maybe there's bloating or other things that have bothered you that she's able to help you troubleshoot. I've, I use her a lot. Oh wow, well that's great. Is she um, accessed only through uh, the cardiovascular medicine? 
That's a great question. I don't know if other services can, other services definitely have nutritionists and mm -hmm. then we have a weight and wellness center too that's completely dedicated towards lifestyle changes for okay. healthy weight um, targets. She does telehealth, which is excellent. It's just available over the phone or over FaceTime yeah. to sort of help get people on the, the right track. Yeah. That's a great resource. All right, another question. Um, I have high blood pressure and have to take medication. I'm trying to make lifestyle changes. <clears throat> if I lose weight or eat healthier, is there a chance that I can get off my high blood pressure medication? Yes, absolutely. And so there's caveats to that. It always depends on how high the blood pressure was to start mm -hmm. um, and how much weight you sort of have to give. Mm -hmm. And so if you're close to your ideal body weight and you losing five or 10 pounds may give you three to five millimeters of mercury, mm -hmm. maybe that's enough where mm -hmm. you drop one medication. Um, same thing with physical activity. It's usually additive, meaning the more of those things you do, lose mm -hmm. a little bit of weight, start exercising more, also, Pantry wise, the big thing with blood pressure is salt. Mm -hmm. um, looking at all those, they can add up to significant changes in blood pressure. And certainly for people who meet criteria for things like bariatric surgery, if you carry a lot of excess weight and you mm -hmm. have and you have high blood pressure, you can almost certainly get rid of diabetes and high blood pressure by addressing the abdominal obesity component because yeah. those tissues are so metabolically active. It's just telling your body to do things like raise the blood pressure when it doesn't need to do that. Yeah. So there's definitely, every person's different and I would suggest that you definitely ask your doctor about what medications you're on and what you could expect with lifestyle changes or the combination of things. Yeah, I think I, I remember seeing a study where they said if you lost 10 pounds, you, you it it's almost directly correlates to a decrease it in does. your blood pressure as well. Which is so. helpful because it's not a huge ask to say yeah. five to even 15 pounds, you know, for bigger men who come in and they're, you know, 200 pounds, but maybe they only need to lose 10 and yeah. then that's a significant change. And a pound a week is a doable amount yeah. of weight loss, a sustainable amount. Often we can find extra calories that we know. You don't really need. You don't really need it. <laughs> the yeah. hospital is guilty of this. There's snacks everywhere <laughs> and I eat more candy here than I do at home. Yeah. But you can <clears throat> usually cut a few. Yeah. I, I think there are a lot of sweets mm -hmm. all throughout the hospital yes. in every single lounge. Yes. So. Um, so many people, including active people, have issues with high blood pressure. Hmm. Why is it important to pay attention to high blood pressure to prevent more advanced heart disease? That's a great question. Um, blood pressure is one of those things where we, are, we do not completely understand it. So what we know is that as people get older, blood pressure marches upward mm -hmm. and that you know by the age of 80 or 90, nine out of 10 people will have been given that diagnosis at some point in their mm -hmm. lifetime, had high blood pressure readings. And we're not sure why our bodies do that because mm -hmm. it's only you know within the last 100 years we've been blessed with the longevity to get to those ages. So yeah. we're still figuring out why it climbs. What we know is that it's not adaptive in a good way mm -hmm. because what we see is for every 10 points above 130 over 80, we're seeing increased risk of heart attack and stroke. The curve mm -hmm. sort of comes up like this. And so above 130, that the risk starts to really climb mm -hmm. in a very linear way at a steep slope. Meaning every time we get your blood pressure down, we're bringing your risk down with it. Yeah. And for us, that's very rewarding. It's a number we can measure. Mm -hmm. It's something we have proven therapies for. They're generally very well tolerated. And while it can be frustrating to have to take multiple medications to achieve it, we know you're decreasing your risk of heart attack. It's yeah. not just lowering the number, it's lowering risk every time you take those. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a something that you'll improve the quality and the years mm -hmm. at the end of your life, mm -hmm. but it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Yeah, because so. I think, <laughs> you know, think about cardiovascular disease, and I know I mentioned that it's the number one cause of death for everyone, for women, particularly contributes to disparities when we think about longevity in populations, mm -hmm. people of color. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just death, it's disability because high blood pressure can cause stroke and mm -hmm. high blood pressure can cause kidney problems. And that could lead to things like dialysis. And a lot of that stuff is avoidable if we focus on sort of the simple seven is what yeah. the AHA has us think through. And we have those up in our clinic actually. Every patient that comes in 
there's a poster with the seven risk factors for cardiovascular disease that we need to make sure we talk about. Yeah. And we've talked about a lot of them, but the smoking, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, the diet, the activity, and your weight. Yeah. And I'm missing one somewhere in there. But That's all right. We'll find it later. We'll find that. <laughs> um, final question. If we are in an emergency situation, is it really true that hands-only CPR is effective? I always thought CPR, including giving breaths by mouth. Yeah, so that was a change. When I went to medical school, we were certainly... Um, taught ABCDs for life-threatening emergencies, mm -hmm. um, and airway was number one for that. What we've realized is actually the critical piece is circulation. Mm -hmm. And so when your heart stops, the problem is you've got blood in your body. It has some oxygen from your previous breaths, it, but it's not moving anywhere to feed the oxygen to your muscles, to your brain. And so starting compressions, high quality ones, these are I, I hope no one here has ever had to deliver those in the community um, or particularly to a family member, but the, these are hard pushes meant to really press through the sternum, that's a thick bone, to get the heart. We're manually pumping blood that has oxygen in it. If we can get an airway with oxygen, we do. Certainly in the hospital, we would get an airway and we would provide oxygenated breaths. But um, there's less emphasis on breathing and more on circulation when you're out in the public and alerting the emergency response. That's the big yeah. thing is making sure if someone's around you, you tell them, call 911 yeah. and start the compressions. Those yeah. are the, the two big first two jobs. Yeah. Well, this has been great. And um, I want to thank um, all of our viewers. Thank you, Carrie Lynn. Um, we talk so much about heart health, I didn't get to ask about you and your family and why you came up to the Upper Valley, but we'll make sure we cover that in February okay. and the healthy living. So Absolutely. anyway, thank you so much for making the time. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended and submitted questions. We are available in cardiology here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. There's locations all over. Um, and we're happy to see anyone who's concerned. I love seeing patients who are concerned about their cardiovascular risk. You don't have to have a diagnosis to come to see a cardiologist if you want a nuanced assessment of your risk. You can see your primary care doctor, but we are very happy to contribute to that discussion. Great. Thank you, Carrie Lynn, and thank you everybody for listening today.